Welcome everybody to the Emerging Issues and Trends in Real Estate Forum. It's a real pleasure to have you all here today. I want to extend a warm tiger welcome to each of you. It's lovely to look out into this room and see so many of you here. It's a wonderful event for us, a real flagship event for us here in the True Last College of Business, and we're really honored that you're sharing in it with us. One of the pillars of our program is outreach between industry and students, and that comes to us in a really exemplary way through the Jeffrey E. Smith Institute of Real Estate whose goal is to equip and prepare students for their career pathways. And this event is our most prominent example of our effort to achieve this vision. Each year, we bring in an incredible and robust agenda, as you all know, of influential business leaders and wonderful networking opportunities for our students, for each other, for us as faculty. And this year, we're really taking it to the next level. We're incredibly pleased to have with us today Kenneth Langone to provide the keynote address, our Senator Kurt Schaefer and Elliot Bross, all of whom will share their wisdom with us and they'll be introduced more formally in just a moment. It's a real pleasure though each year to see such an amazing caliber of speakers and we're really glad that we can share all of the wonderful insights and learning that we'll have coming to us throughout the afternoon. The caliber of this event really is a testament to what the Jeffrey E. Smith Institute strives to accomplish every year. It's a real pleasure to work with Jeff and his team. Really, uh, quite frankly, they just get it, what we're trying to do in higher education, specifically in business education on behalf of our students. They really understand the complexity of the moving parts, and they support us in our effort to both bring education to our students, to bring continuing education to our business partners, to inspire us as faculty, and all of that really creates a lot of competitive advantage for the school, which I think you see as you meet our students and hear how accomplished they are. This forum is sort of the apex of all that effort and it takes a tremendous effort by a lot of people, especially our JES partners. So if we could just take a moment to give the JES team a round of applause for everything they've done for us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the leader of the JES team, Jeff Smith. Jeff is the founder, of course, of the Jeffrey E. Smith Institute of Real Estate and is the president of JES Holdings. He brings more than 30 years of experience in real estate and housing business and is an affordable housing advocate, implementing supportive service and coordination for seniors and families. JES Community partners with local resources to assist with financial planning, home ownership, and family and social services. Jeff has led the passage of tax credit legislation in Missouri that's helped preserve historic buildings throughout the state. He's a recognized leader in affordable housing industry and has been presented with the Governor's Award for Excellence in Elderly Housing in Missouri. He's a fifth generation Boone County resident, and for those of you from out of town, that's right here. He's a major donor to numerous charitable, civic, and educational organizations, including the Missouri Review, which offers the Smith Prize for Fiction, Nonfiction, and Poetry, Boys and Girls Club, United Way, Central Missouri Food Bank, and Arrow Rock Lyceum Theater, and very proudly, his alma mater, Mizzou and the True Last College of Business. It's through this generosity that we have the Jeffrey E. Smith Institute of Real Estate, and he's also one of my most treasured members of the advisory board here in the True Last College of Business. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Smith. Thank you, Joan. Um, here we go. I know we have a large group here, but I thought maybe we'd start, well, right down here. Stand up and tell us your name and tell us a little bit about yourself. We'll go around the room. <laughs> okay, that didn't work. Uh, we'll have some comments later, but uh, I think time-wise, uh, we're going to go ahead and get to introducing Harvey Eisen. And Harvey's right over here. Harvey's one of my close friends. 64 graduate of uh, the University of Missouri. He uh, bus tables in a fraternity here, ZBT. Bus tables and worked his way through college. Uh, as a smart guy, was senior vice president of Travelers. Worked for Sandy Weil, it's interesting. We've been up at Tigers and Wall Street on that. Um, Harvey's one of the brighter, more interesting guys I've, uh, I've ever met. And so normally I give him a lot of trouble, but I won't right now. Uh, he was Mike Bloomberg, the mayor of New York. I'm sure you've heard of him. And he was his roommate for a number of years in New York. And um, then uh, you've seen him on Wall Street Week, CNBC and CNN. And Harvey developed a really neat thing called Tigers on Wall Street. 
and has led this group for many years up in New York where the students get to go up to New York. And um, it's, it's been an interesting uh, experience, whether they meet J Jamie Dimon or where they go to Goldman Sachs or um, Ace Greenberg, you name it. Harvey puts together a, a lot of work. Ken Langone, who um, was here, I think, this last, uh, last trip, who I heard was one of the best uh, speakers and gave one of the best talks of anybody we've ever talked to. And uh, Harvey's also done the, uh, taking the unit, started taking the MU kids up to uh, see Warren Buffett. We did that many, many, many years ago. And have taken the university group up to uh, introduce him. And uh, Warren's been nice enough to speak at this forum. We have Ken Langone today, which we, I owe through Harvey and his friendship with Mr. Langone. Currently, uh, Harvey's with the uh, Bedford Oak Advisors. He's in, in one of those investment guys from New York, <laughs> but uh, it's okay. But uh, I want to welcome Harvey, a good friend. He's on our board, and uh, he's going to speak to you a little bit. Uh, He's going to introduce Mr. Langone. So, Harvey. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good to be back. I always like to come back to this room because it reminds me the only time I ever got in this room when I was here was when I was wearing a little tie and a white shirt and a little coat and uh, removing plates. <laughs> uh, Ken Langone has been a friend for many, many years. How long? 20, 30 years? More. Uh, Ken, uh, I have to tell you this stuff, received a BA from Bucknell University and an MBA from NYU Stern School. Chairman of the Board of Trustees of New York University Medical Center. You remember during uh, Sandy when all those people were being hauled out of the hospital because they had power problems? That, that, that's Ken's hospital. Just wanted you to know that. <laughs> yeah, hell of a guy. Uh, he has been involved with NYU in various capacities and on board. Um, about 30 years ago, he founded this company called Home Depot, and he hired a couple of guys named, uh, what's it, Arthur Blank, and who's the other guy? Bernie Marcus. Bernie Marcus. Uh, they worked for a friend of mine named, uh, he should rest him, forget his name. They worked for a friend of mine at a place called Handy Dan, and this guy decided they weren't very good executives, so he fired them. And they went to see Ken Langone, and. Ken said, that's the best thing that ever happened to you guys. We're going to put you in business, and, and the rest is, is history. So the bottom line is, uh, when I came here 100 years, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and then they got me back, um, I said, well, uh, OK, I'd like to see the University of Missouri uh, have two things. Uh, number one, I'd like it to be more than a flyover zone, which is what everybody on the East Coast knows the rest of the United States between Manhattan and Los Angeles. And more importantly, that we could uh, bring some real world um, input to the academic process. Not that the academic process isn't important, but real world helps. So. I met Ken Langone, we've been buddies, no, we've been friends for years, and um, I've been blessed to meet a lot of really uh, wonderful people, some of whom have actually been successful. Uh, Warren Buffett, uh, the Buffett, we have this Buffett course here, and I think we give out some scholarships to some people in the room. And um, my, my old roommate and closest friend and trustee for my children, Mike Bloomberg, who now became mayor of New York and one of the richest guys in the world. But I will tell you um, as candidly as I can, um, if you said to me, pick one of these characters that you've met that really you'd have to go with, uh, it would be Ken Langone. 
And this year, um, we got Ken to speak to our Tigers on Wall Street, and he was just terrific. And right before this meeting, I, I introduced Ken to Mary Beth Mars. And I said, Ken, of all the people you're going to meet, outside, of course, Dean Gable, who will beat me up if I don't, uh, and some of the faculty here, uh, this is a woman, these two women know how to get things done. So, uh, some of you in this room think that what we do here makes sense, does it make sense? But after Ken gave a presentation in New York, I get a note from him saying, I cannot believe that I got these handwritten notes from these students from the University of Missouri. And I said, Ken, they were so impressed with you, they were so taken by you, but the point is simple. The point is that Jeff does a lot, I do a little, but the students are the key. And the key to the world, not this world or the New York world, but the world, are individuals like Ken Langone. So Ken is going to share his thoughts with you and then take your questions, but it is truly one of the great honors to introduce Ken Lango. Before I get um, taken on by my former adversary, Elliot Spitzer, I want to clarify some points. Uh, I didn't hire Bernie and Arthur. What happened was I owned 19% of Handy Dan. And the man that you're talking about, I believe, is Sandy Sigaloff, who, <laughs> who has gone to his maker. And I, my hope is that his maker would see him for what he really was, as opposed to just letting him into heaven. Uh, but but when, I, when I was persuaded by Bernie to sell my interest in Handy Dan back to Sandy Sigaloff, I said, he'll, if I do that, he's going to fire you. He needs me. I said, no, he doesn't need anybody. If you ask Sandy who he needs, there's nobody on this earth that he needs. He can do it all by himself, and he'll fire you. So Bernie finally persuaded me, and I said, okay, if you want to do it. And Sandy had to have me. He, I was sort of a thorn in his side. And he had to have me out in the worst way, so he paid me an outlandish price, which common sense dictated. I say yes. But I told Bernie on the morning that I had the meeting with Sigaloff's lawyers on the Avenue of the Stars in LA, that Bernie, you'll be out of here within three months. Said, what do you mean? I said, he's going to fire you. You're wrong. I was wrong. About three and a half months later, on a Saturday, I got a call from Bernie. Bernie was a professional manager. He was 48. And by the way, for you young people, just think of this. He was 48 years old. He had three children. He had no net worth. He had all kinds of obligations. So think about that when you decide to take risk. Because if you don't take risk, nothing will happen. So anyway, so he calls me up, and I said, I gather you were fired. He says, well, isn't it in the papers yet? I said, no, but it's Saturday, and my son told me you've been calling here all day. Yes, he fired me. He fired Arthur. He fired Ron. I said, how long will it take you to get to New York? And he said to me, uh, I can be there tomorrow morning. I said, fine, I'll see you for breakfast at Peacock Alley at the Waldorf Astoria at 8.30. And I said, what'd you get fired for? He said, well, some labor law violation. And I said, well, do you know a good labor lawyer? He said, yes, I do. And uh, I said, bring him to breakfast, too. So they flew across the United States that very night. And the next morning, at P in Peacock Alley, we had breakfast. And the <laughs> Bernie and Arthur and Ron Brill were all fired, presumably because of this labor law violation. So I turned to, and the lawyer was Jerry Glassman, a very close friend of Bernie's, a very prominent labor attorney in New York. And before I started, I said, Bernie, I have only one thing to say, for you, to say to you, and ladies and gentlemen, forgive me, but I'll tell you exactly what I said. And Bernie, I said, you just got hit in the ass with a golden horseshoe and you don't know it. 
And he looks distraught, and he's like, well, you nuts, I've got no money, I've got a family, I've got nothing, blah, 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 and this guy's firing me, and he wants to do all kinds of bad things to me. And I turned to Jerry Glassman, and I said, Jerry, is Bernie going to go to jail? He said, of course he's not going to jail. I said, fine. And Bernie said, why'd you ask that question? And I said, well, because you can't run a company from jail. <laughs> now, about a year before that, Bernie had told me of this concept wouldn't tell me all of it, but enough of it to, to intrigue me. So I said, Bernie, remember that thing? You, and by the way, we were in a, a grand opening, believe it or not, of a handy Dan Home Improvement Center in Kansas City. And we, it was the night before. It was a soft opening, and I was going nuts. I couldn't believe the store, how wonderful it was, blah, blah, blah. And Bernie grabbed me and says, don't get too enthusiastic, because somebody's going to come along and knock us off and it's going to change the industry. So I kept that in the back of my mind, and that Sunday morning I said, Bernie, you told me about this thing, let's do it. Arthur was already planning to go to Palm Springs. Arthur was a CPA, and he was planning, among other things, to think about opening up an accountancy for lawyers and doctors that lived in Palm Springs. And Bernie, I said, Bernie, what do you want to do? He said, well, I need Arthur, I need Ron, and I said, well, let's do it. And where do we get the money from? Long story short, we raised $2 million to start the company. Anybody who put in $25,000 and kept it all away would have $150 million in Home Depot stock today. So it worked out pretty good. And I have two people, very close friends of mine, both of whom, a husband and wife, they each put $25,000 and they've never sold a share. That's why I know how much it's worth. And she, by the way, named Home Depot, Home Depot. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here believe it or not, because I'm on a mission. And I want to say a few things about America first. Would undergraduate students, could you all raise your hands for me, please? Good, good, good. A lot of undergraduates, OK. I'm here to tell you one thing. The future of America has never been better. Now, you may not see that now. And as you get in the process of interviewing for jobs and worrying about your future, those are stressful times. I've been there. Harvey's been there. Jim's been there. We've all been there. We all worry. But I can assure you there'll be never, ever again another nation on this earth like America. And I honest to God believe in my heart of heart, and with my wallet as well, that our best days are ahead of us. I have invested so far this year in more venture capital deals than the previous five years put together. And it's only now the middle of April, the end of April. <laughs> the opportunities are profound, and they're there waiting for you. But they require a couple of things. When you get tired, work twice as hard because you're only half effective. And if you don't understand the value and importance of relationships, it won't happen. Uh, I was recently, uh, uh, last year, inducted into the Horatio Alger Association, and for my speech, I made a remark that's probably the truest thing I ever said, that if, if to get this honor meant you had to be self-made, then I shouldn't get this honor, because the help I've had along my whole career, even right up until now, the help I get from other people, assures me of one thing, I'm anything but self-made. So it's very, very important that you understand that the opportunities are there. And I'm not here to discourage you. In fact, I'm here, hopefully, today to motivate you to do things which I think need to be done in America. And if you do them, will assure what I say about the future of America being. I believe it in my heart of hearts. I'll tell you one more thing. I'm a very proud American. My grandparents came from Italy. They had nothing. My grandfather left school at the age of six years old. And his entire life, he had a shovel in his hand. If you come to my office, you'll see a picture of my grandfather and grandmother at their 50th wedding anniversary. And if you look at his left hand, it looks like it's deformed. Well, it wasn't deformed. It, it was all the calluses that developed on his hands from having a shovel in his hands from the time he was six years old until the day he died at 72. This is the greatest country on earth, and there'll never be another one like it. And I say to those people who don't believe that, get the hell out of here because we're going we're gonna to have our very best days. The opportunities, the, the, the challenges. And by the way, part of what in my enthusiasm rests with seeing people like you and you're anxious. Incidentally, I have more courage saying what I'm going to say today here in the Midwest 
that I would have either in New York or in California for obvious reasons when you hear what I have to say. But to begin with, please leave here. Do the best you can while you're here. Leave here. Make some great friendships. Remember that much of life is luck. Can't do anything about that. But I can also tell you that the harder you work, the luckier you're going to get. So they go hand in hand. But again, there may be people out there who are self-made. I'm not one of those people. I've been blessed to have wonderful relationships and friendships, starting with my mother and father and my wife of 56 years and my children. I, I, I've had more blessings than one man should be entitled to, but for whatever reason, the good Lord gave them to me. But I tell you this because you've got to leave here with a spirit of enthusiasm and passion. And the day you're in a job that you don't want to go to work, quit the job. I can honest to God tell you that it's now, uh, it'll be 56 years, June, 20, June 3rd, that I went to work. I can't think of one day in those 56 years that I wouldn't have paid to go to work. And to this day, I'm, I'll be 78 in the fall, I can't wait to get to work every single day. I love my work. I love what I'm doing. And guess what? The more you like and enjoy what you're doing, the better you're going to be at it. But there's got to be passion, and there's got to be enthusiasm, and there's got to be conviction. And for those of you who choose to be entrepreneurs, remember this one rule for me. The best deals I ever did were the ones I didn't do. Remember that. So leave here, leave here with passion, with enthusiasm, with the assurance that better days are ahead, that nothing has happened in America compared to what's going to happen in the future. I, I'm in five, this year, five brand new startups with totally new technologies. It's going to happen. It'll happen to you. You've got to find them. You know, and, I, and I, I think I told a story to the kids that came up to New York about the pessimist and the optimist. I think it bears mention again. <clears throat> there was a father who had two sons. One was a pessimist and one was an optimist. So one Christmas, the father decided to do an, exper an experiment. He went out and he got magnificent gifts and had them all beautifully wrapped in different colors and put in one room, all of them. And then he went out and he got a pile of horse manure and put it in another room. And one kid was an optimist and one kid was a pessimist. So he takes the optimist, pessimist and puts him in the room with all of these magnificent gifts. And he takes the optimist and he puts him in a room with a pile of horse manure. And he waits an hour. And an hour later he goes into the room where the pessimist was. Nothing has been touched. He says, Johnny, what's wrong? He said, Pop, I don't like the wrapping. I'm sure if I open it, it'll be something I already have. I'm sure it'll be something that doesn't fit or I won't like it. And the father leaves discouraged. He goes down a hall to the next room where the optimist is with the horse manure. And the kid's flinging the horse manure around and whistling and laughing. And he says, what's going on, Pete? He said, Pop, with a pile of horse manure like this, there's got to be a pony around someplace. <laughs> don't forget that. The world belongs to optimists. Because we, and I am an optimist. My wife calls me Pollyanna sometimes. We see the best in everything. We see adversity as advantage. Henry Kaiser had a wonderful expression. Problems are opportunities in work clothes. Don't forget that either. So, so much for your future. It's out there. It's waiting for you. It's all about you, and it's all about what you do. The last thing I would say is, and I think I said this to Harvey flying down, I don't think I've ever done one deal in all my years in business where I couldn't have gotten a better deal than I got. In other words, I didn't trade to the max. And I firmly believe that's the best way to develop lasting friendships and relationships. Where, where people feel like you're going to work towards a fair deal for everybody. And sometimes to make sure it's fair, you take less than what you could have gotten. And that's OK. I, you know, I did OK. I, maybe I could have done a little better, but I did OK. I did the best I could. Now let me tell you why I'm taking advantage of this visit to this wonderful institution 
And I want to ask the, the, the kids that are here, the students, raise your hand if you're concerned about the environment in the future. Please raise your hand. Look, raise them high. Be proud of that. Okay. Well, that tells me one thing. You're worried about the future. Let me have one of you kids tell me why you're concerned about the environment and why you're interested in the environment. Well, one of you that raise your hands, would you please just give me a short reason why? Somebody? I thought I saw. Yes, sir. No, no. In the environment, I'm talking about the air and the elephants and the, you know, all, all that stuff. Yeah, but I'm asking you about why are, and I, God bless you people for being concerned about the environment. Because we only have one. But why are you interested? Yes, sir. I was lucky enough to experience it growing up and right. a lot. Okay. Okay. I was praying you'd give me exactly that answer. One of the things I want to talk to today to you about is generational theft, okay? And if there's people in this room approaching my age, this may make you uncomfortable, but I think we need to be made uncomfortable. There's an enormous crisis in America. I mention the environment because that proves to me you're interested in the future. If we don't do something about entitlements in America, each and every one of you kids that are leaving here with dreams and ideas, you'll be seniors one day like I am. And the cupboard will be bare. There is something inherently and morally wrong with me flying here today in my own airplane, flying back to New York in my own airplane, and once every month the United States government sends me a check for $2,300 and my wife a check for $1,100. We won. We shouldn't get five cents from the government. The same is true with our health care. I'm blessed and I'm honored beyond words to say that my name is on one of the great medical centers in the world. I understand that with my net worth, I should be responsible for my own health care. I should pay. Remember this, if we don't address this problem, if you don't address this problem, you, when you get to be my age, you're going to wish you had. Because there's going to be nothing there to take care of those of you who didn't do as well as I did, or as Harvey did. The notion that I paid into Social Security and it's a contract, forget it. I like to tell people that use that argument, yeah, I entered into a contract for fire insurance for my house. Dear God, please never let me have a claim for fire insurance. But if I did, the insurance company bought the risk, or I should say, took on the risk. I bought the right to pass it on. But I can't think of one year when I didn't have a fire that I went to the insurance company and said to the insurance company, give me my premiums back, I didn't have a fire. I understand why Social Security was created. I understand why all these entitlements were created. And by the way, this is not partisan. Entitlement costs went up faster under George W. Bush's eight years than on any other time in the history of the country. So, there's plenty of blame to go, I'm not here to blame. I'm here to tell you that unless you people get organized and have a counter pressure to people like me, who the congressmen and senators are terrified of, it won't happen. But if you create a counter force to address the greed, frankly the greed, from people like me, it will not change. You're far smarter than we were. You're more ambitious than we were. You've got energy like we used to have. And our energy is going down. Let me give you a number. Every single day, 10,000 people in America turn 65 years old. 
And those costs are going to keep going up like that. And there's a powerful force at work called lobbyists that have terrified, terrorized our elected officials to don't touch this because it's the third rail of politics. Well, you make your own third rail and let those congressmen and senators then understand they're going to have to answer to you for what they're doing on the other end. We cannot long, you mentioned the debt, sir, we cannot long continue to do what we're doing as a nation and not pay a horrible price for it. And we will. In spite of that, don't take a thing away from what I said earlier. I still believe our best days ahead of us as a nation. I still think the opportunities for you are 10 times better than they were for me. I wish I was your age so I could take advantage of all those opportunities. But unless you people get organized and unless you get together and let our elected officials understand there is a price to pay for not addressing these issues. If you don't do that, when you're my age, you won't have to worry about Social Security or entitlements because there won't be any. We will be busted as a nation. The math is there. This, there's nothing, nobody will argue the numbers. The numbers are there to speak. So I'm pleading with you. I'm asking you to think about it, if not just in selfish interest, but what's right for the country and what's good for the country. I don't want old people to go without anything, but I think there's got to be judicious treatment. I shouldn't get a thing. And by the way, I made a promise to myself that I would never cash a government check. And every single Social Security check I've ever gotten, I've signed over to a charity every month. Because it would be, to me, so wrong, so morally wrong for me to take money from my government for as good as this country's been to me. And the opportunities it's given me, and the fact that I won. In regards to money, I won. And therefore, I should have some self-respect and say, this is not, I shouldn't get this. On the other hand, we met these two lovely ladies over here with Jim this morning. These are lovely people, and I don't know what their net worth are, but probably they need it. My mother and father, my father was a plumber. My mother worked in a school cafeteria. And this was before Home Depot became what it became. They needed their Social Security very much, and they should get it. So I'm not arguing we should do away with it. I'm saying we need to be more judicious about it. I think we need to understand that as we are right now, it's not sustainable. And the only hope that exists, in my mind, is for all of you people, all of you young people, and we can fix this. We can say to people 55 and older, we're not going to touch you. But then we can say about your generation, well, you're going to retire at 70. Hell, look at what's going on with life expectancy in America. Right now, if you live to be 80, you got a good shot of living to be 100. So all of the science is here, but unless we address what we have to do, but again, I tell you, don't expect a lot of courage out of your elected officials because their first concern typically, I know I have a state senator in the room and I apologize if I offend you, but <laughs> it is what it is. The first thing they worry about every day and the last thing they worry about every night is getting reelected. We would cure these problems if we had term limits, but we'll never have term limits. This won't happen. So what we have to do then is create a force, create an energy that addresses these issues and forces these politicians to make the right choices. And if we don't do that, shame on us. And you people who have so much at risk, you're, in, you're, you're worthy of it, you're entitled to it, you should have it. This is wrong. It is generational theft, and I mean that without any emotional statement. It's, it's me stealing money from you. It won't happen. But it, if you can, you guys get organized. Let me tell you something. Look at what you've done on the last two presidential elections. You got the power. Get organized. Be a counterforce to AARP, and I'm sure there's AARP members in here. I'm sorry. I don't belong to AARP because I think sometimes enough is enough. And we can't keep going back to our elected officials, give us more, give us more, because it's coming out of the pockets of these kids that have worked like hell to go out and have a future. And I can't do it for you, you have to do it yourself, but I'm pleading with you do it. 
I'm absolutely pleading with you from the bottom of my heart that if you don't do it, nothing will happen. On the other hand, if you show, if you show some structure and you show some passion, eventually the politicians will get the message and will do what they have to do and we'll fix it. We can fix this. This is fixable. Freeze, freeze entitlements. No, I just got a raise, by the way. I got a cost of living adjustment on my Social Security. I got another 33 or 34 bucks a month. This is nuts. Can you imagine me here today getting a check? By the way, don't try and give it back to me. I mean, that's, forget it. So I plead with you for your own sake and for the sake of the kids. You're all going to be seniors one day. Don't forget that. And you're going to have children, and you're going to have grandchildren. And you have to start thinking about those generations, because if we don't think of those generations, forget about yourself. OK? Now, the second thing I'm here, and this, this really gets me with a, with a bullseye on my back. Uh, could I have a show of hands of the faculty in the room today? Okay, I, I want to assure you of one thing. I, 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 among my other things in life, I taught. I was, uh, I was on the faculty at NYU Business School and at the, school of, the old School of Commerce, Accounts, and Finance up at Washington Square. And the second thing I want to talk about today, we, we, all, we all acknowledge diversity is important, and I agree with that. Diversity in every single respect. What about intellectual diversity? What about understanding what a university should be about? Which is to encourage people to think broadly and to take into account as many possible factors as possible and then make your mind up. There's a movement in America today to discourage intellectual diversity. And I can see to the faculty the power you have, I don't say you exercise it, but there are those who do, that if a kid dares to disagree with you, you can get even with them. And don't kid yourself. A lot of kids know that, and a lot of kids hold back. But if we really want the best and the brightest, we will think of those kids having access to all forms of thought and diversity of thought, and encourage those kids, based on the facts and the circumstances, to develop an answer that takes into account all of the necessary facts that are out there. And I plead with you young people, unless you're capable of flexibility of thought, you can't win. I wish I had a nickel every time I walked in with this thought and realized it wasn't this thought, it was that thought. And I will tell you this, that in the time I went to college, I was always excited by the fact that intellectual diversity was thought, was allowed. And I'm sorry that's not happening much anymore. Oop, the hell did I, okay. Don't worry about it. JES, you're going to get all kinds of publicity when the headlines come out about me taking on the faculty today. But I mean this to the faculty. You want your kids to leave here with an open mind about everything, but with the encouragement of how the thought process works. And what's, Harvey, how many times have you and I had thought we had a great idea in a deal? And then I call somebody up that I understand doesn't like it. And I find out they're right and I'm wrong. Thank God, because I didn't do the deal and I saved some money. But the same is true as with everything in life. Because you'll do your best work and your best thinking when you have an open mind. A publication I'm not terribly excited about <clears throat> is the New York Times. But I read it every day. Because <clears throat> I think it's important for me to understand the other side of the argument. I can sit here candidly, and I hope objectively, and say that much of what happened in America between 2001 and 2009 happened under a Republican president 
and I am a dyed-in-the-wool conservative Republican. But there's an old saying, who dares ignore history is doomed to repeat it. And so I think it's critical. I say this to the faculty. And of course, in business courses, there's much less because that's far more objective. It's numbers and so on and so forth. But I, I guess I mean this more in the broader context of this great institution that everything you teach. University, to me, should be where a kid goes to learn how to think. Because the one thing I was not good at was memorizing. And then years later, it did, dawned on me it really didn't matter because I still have trouble remembering what grades I got when I was in college, but I know I got a degree. But I'm grateful for the fact that I was thought, taught how thought should work. And I think that's at risk today in higher education in America. And I think, again, the problem, this problem is a greater problem than generational theft to me for one reason, because I don't know how to deal with those people who have the power of the pen and grades to punish a kid that dares to speak out in opposition to what he's heard. And that's a real threat. Like it or not, that is a real threat. And if it, if it isn't a real threat, it's certainly in the minds of these kids. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think that's a challenge for the faculty. You want a lot of yes students? Or do you want a lot of kids that leave here with a keen mind and the practice and the ability to weigh all the factors and then make their minds up? It's your call. I can tell you right now, the guys that I know that are successful, and the gals as well, have incredibly open minds about facts and circumstances and make their own mind up. Sometimes they're early, sometimes they're wrong, sometimes they're late, but they do it. And I urge each of you people about to leave here and go out in this tough world, it's a tough world, but it's the only one we got, and it's got opportunities that are boundless. You can't believe the opportunities that are out there. You will benefit, you will capitalize on those opportunities if you have an open mind and consider all the factors. And I'm afraid what's going on in academia today in America, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm vice chairman of NYU, the university. I'm a trustee of the university. I'm chairman of the medical center. I'm vice chairman of the, of the business school. I can tell you right now, we have the same problem. Now, when I talk to faculty about it, they push back and say, you're wrong. I say, yeah, I'm wrong. So if I'm wrong, better that I be wrong, blow the whistle unnecessarily than to have kids exposed to one way of thinking. I find this particularly difficult in my own alma mater, Bucknell University, where the economics department was all of one mind. Now, I, I've had some sway up there. You know, one thing about writing a check, they may not like you anymore, but they sure have to listen to you, okay? <laughs> In fact, they probably like me less, but that's besides the point. And the new president we got, who's spectacular, I've told them that I want to challenge the faculty to make sure these kids have a chance in their life to make up their own minds using the minds that were developed in the universities and colleges where they went, and prayfully, in that process, make the right decision. So those are the two reasons I'm here to take advantage of you. Generational theft, intellectual diversity. We've come a long way in America in regard to diversity. We've got a long way to go, don't misunderstand me. But we've come a long way. But I'm frightened by the notion that there's only one way to address an issue. But that's not so. So I thought what I'd do now is I would take some questions from the audience, and, and believe me, I got a thick skin, so if you disagree with me and you want to push back, I love it, okay? I mean, I love, in fact, ever since my lawyers did such a great job with Mr. Spitzer, nobody wants to fight me anymore, so. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back? Thank you very much for having me.
I can hear you. Not politics, about your future. This is not politics. This is about your future and the risk to your future of what's happening in America today. The politicians, again, no offense, Senator, but <laughs> I haven't very, met very many of them with a lot of courage, frankly, okay? Everybody's best interest in mind. Right. Not one sided. So I wanted to ask you so 93% of the time the candidate with the most money uh, wins the election. Uh -huh. And I wanted to ask you how you're so optimistic about the future um, when, under those circumstances, it, it technically uh, leads to a situation where um, lobbyists and corporations as the Citizens United can buy off politicians and influence their decision making. So Look, I, I wish there was a better system than the one we have, but it's the only one we have and we have to live with it. Trust me, at the end of the day, votes have more power than money. AARP is one of those organizations that pours huge sums of money. And on the other side, you've got the Chamber of Commerce pouring huge sums of money into it. But if you people get organized and galvanized, trust me, that's more powerful than any money. And they'll jump in front of the parade. Trust me, they'll jump in front of that parade. You're young, you've got ambition, you've got incredible energy, you're the best educated kids we've ever had in this country, ever. Won't continue for long, by the way, with what's going on in the public schools, I can tell you that. In fact, the current generation of children in public schools today, and I know a little bit about this, I'm chairman of a charter school, in Harlem. The current generation of students in public schools today will be the first generation in the history of America that has a lower literacy rate than the previous generation. Think about that. So back to you, sir. We didn't have a lot of money when we started Home Depot. But all the things I said, we had, any, let me tell you what we had to do, the things we did. We had these big boxes. Well, they were, they were, they were originally 180,000 square feet each. And we persuaded J.C. Penney, there were Treasure Island stores, there were four of them in Atlanta, we persuaded them to demise, to build walls and give us 60,000 square feet. We only had $2 million and a few more bucks that we borrowed. And so, we wanted people to come into the store and say, oh my God, look at all the merchandise in the store. The problem is, with our weak balance sheet, the vendors wouldn't give us the merchandise. So we solved the problem. We persuaded them to give us empty boxes with their labels on them, and we put those boxes up in the overheads, and people came, oh my God, look at all the merchandise they got in this building. In my opinion, imagination and effort always wins over money. Always. Don't be discouraged. Yes, there is a lot of money. There's too much money in the political process in America. I concede that to you. And I'm one of the culprits. I go out and I raise money and I give money. I understand that. But that doesn't mean the underlying issue isn't there and you with your energy and your force, you've proven that. You've proven that. Look at what you are, have done with people to be conscious of the environment. That's why I asked that question. Because they hear you. If you go to Washington and you go to a congressman or a senator's office and you come back from lunch with them, one of the first things they want to know is the calls coming in and what are they saying. Very interesting. Not how much money they got, but which way is the wind blowing. Please, don't be discouraged. It may be more challenging, but it's still possible. And I think of all of you, I say you, I mean collectively all of you kids all over America. Take us on. Stop us from stealing from you. We are stealing from you. I am stealing from you. I'm admitting it. It's wrong. 
It defies every moral and ethical principle I've ever been taught. I don't need it, I shouldn't get it. Let's have accountability. Do you want to know something? Something new in America? More people will die of obesity than starvation in America right now. How's that? We used to die of starvation. No more. Shouldn't there be responsibility? Smokers, you want to smoke? Pay $15 a pack and put $10 a pack into a fund that when you get lung cancer, God forbid, or some other horrible disease, the money's there to take care of you. It's your money. Be a little entrepreneurial. But don't be discouraged. Trust me, if you kids get organized, and I don't mean kids in a pejorative way. I mean it respectfully. And by the way, I wish I was a kid, okay? So take it that way. But if you get organized, you can make it happen. But you're the only chance we have to get these politicians to listen to the other side of the argument. Because right now, all they're hearing are guys like me. Next question. Yes, sir, in the back. You've made a lot of good points um, about where a country needs to go um, and where it is going. And on CNBC, you've been asked several times about why yourself you haven't run for office. Um, and you've answered that you are too honest to run uh, for office. No, I said I don't like the lie, is what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so what do you think needs to change in our uh, political climate, in our government, um, for us to start electing honest people um, Look, into office? Let me, let me make one thing clear. There's an awful lot of dedicated, passionate, wonderful, honest politicians that are in office in America. Thank God. Okay? I'm not suggesting that for a minute. But I go back to man's basic instinct, which is survival. And survival in their world is re-election. I'll give you a for instance. I was a very passionate supporter of U.S. term limits. Because I really believe the ultimate answer. When a guy's got one year to go and he's got to go home, trust me, he'll, do, he'll vote the right way. Or she'll vote the right way. So, I got a call one day from Howie Rich, who runs U.S. term limits. And he said to me, he had a guy that was going to run against, uh, I think, Foley. His name was Jim Nethercutt. And Jim Nethercutt came in to see me, and he understood the pledge was, for the House, you run three terms and you go home. For the Senate, you run two terms and you go home. That was our pitch. And, and if you took that pledge, we took it on ourselves to go out and help you raise money to get reelected, to get elected. So fast forward, Jim wins. Fast forward six years, Howie calls me and says, Jim Nethercutt wants to come in to see you. And I said, sure, what's he want to see me about? He said, well, I'd rather you, he tell you rather than me tell you. I said, okay. So Jim Nethercutt comes, in, Nethercutt comes in and says, you know, I didn't realize what a mess Washington was. Six years isn't enough. I need more time to help, as if he was going to clean the mess up himself. I said, Jim, you got us because it's too late now. See you in two years. And we got him. I, I believe the ultimate answer is term. Maybe other people. I hear all this stuff about expertise and, and experience and all. Guess what? Guess what? Maybe we got too much expertise and we got too much experience, okay? And too much smart. Because, oh, and, and the staff guys leaving. Uh -uh. Let's go back to them. We'll, we'll typically do the right thing and make the right decisions. People are good that way. So, First of all, you, you would never want me in politics, ever. It would be the worst thing for, forget me, for America, it would be the worst thing for me to run for anything. But that doesn't mean I haven't got a right to an opinion. And as you hear today, I exercise that right rather liberally and, and clearly. <laughs> Question over here? Anybody? Yes, sir. Thank you for taking my question. Um, so in the short term, the stock market's back up, but confidence isn't there. And in your mind, what has to happen in 2013 and 2014 for America to regain the confidence of the consumers and the business owners and the rest of the world? You make a good point. Uh, I don't know if anybody took note of IBM's numbers on Friday, but they had very tepid top line growth. In fact, they didn't have any. Uh, where I sit and what I see, 
Harvey and I talked about this today coming down. Businesses are going to grow not so much by expansion of the market they're in, but by poaching on the other guy's market share. That's one way to do it. Or new technology. You know, when you've got a new technology that satisfies you, and believe me, there are so many human wants out there today that aren't being met. These are your opportunities. So don't forget that. Don't leave here excited. Leave here enthusiastic. Leave here with passion. Because it's out there. But, but, yes, we have problems. But we have to begin by addressing the problems of where we are as a nation. We cannot forever live on debt. Can't do it. And right now, we're going in a hole a trillion dollars a year. And it's not sustainable. So maybe we need a crash. Maybe we need hard times. I pray we don't. I think if, if we can get all of you people, you're it. You are more than the future of this country. You are this future. You are this country. But if we can get these people to make the tough decisions, and what are the tough decisions? Langone, no more Social Security for you. Langone, you pay your own health insurance. You write all these checks to these charities and these clubs and this and that and the other thing, you take care of it. Have a means test. On the other hand, these two lovely ladies I met over here at this retirement community, they shouldn't want for a thing. And there's plenty to do both. There's no reason any American should ever go to bed hungry or without, without proper health care. None. Not one reason. We are the greatest nation on earth and we've demonstrated respect for human rights as good as any nation on earth. But we have to be realistic. So the market will do what it's want to do. But I can tell you right now, the reason that the market's doing so well is people are chasing yield. They want income. So where are you going to get income? You're not going to get income in bonds. And in fact, if you buy bonds, you're running the risk of losing a lot of money. Because if rates go back up and you've got a 10-year bond or a 15-year bond, Unless you take it to maturity, you're going to lose money, and then you lose purchasing power instead. And so you buy stocks. You, I showed Harvey this morning. Home Depot has raised its dividend from 2008, 90. I'm, this is not a recommendation to buy Home Depot, OK? <laughs> its dividend has gone from 90 cents a share annually in 2008. This year, it's going to be $1.56. That's, uh, that's, that's up 60 some percent in five years. That's pretty good. And a lot of other companies are just like it. Look at the dividend increases. Look at the stock buybacks. So I'm torn because on the one hand, you know, if, if, unfortunately, I've had the experience of having to deal with somebody that's got a substance abuse problem. And the only time you really make success if you've been involved in an intervention is when you're in crisis. And that person understands what's at risk. And I hope none of you ever have to have that experience, but I did more than once. And it, that's a moment of inflection. Okay? Answer your question. Don't give up. Next question. Yes, sir. Well, let me, let me say this to you. My walking off point of whether I'll do a deal or not do a deal is the people I'm dealing with. Whenever I've invested with good people, for the most part I've done okay, and whenever I've allowed my judgment to be overridden by my greed, I've gotten burned. So I, I can only tell you right now there's no substitute for being in business with good, decent, hardworking, ethical, honorable people. You don't know that sometimes until you're in the deal, but you do as much as you can. Now, the, what are the areas I'm interested in? Well, I told you about how 10,000 people are going to turn 65 every day. It's a huge market right there. You want an opportunity. It's a huge, and thank God they're living longer. And not only that, they're living better quality lives. These, these two ladies we met today, one is 92 years old, sharp as a tack, dressed to the night, wonderful, nice apartment, everything. So there's an enormous market that's growing like a weed right there. On the other hand, I'll give you another one. Uh, 
when you get a knee replacement, I'm, I, I tend to move towards healthcare because that's been my background. But we have an investment in a company that's got a device that before the surgeon, after he puts your knee replacement knee in, and before he sews it up, he typically has you up on, on a support. You're knocked out. You don't know this is happening. And he's going like this with your knee to see for alignment. This company has a device it invented that slides into the knee that lets the surgeon know that it's in alignment. And indeed, they're working on a new one where it's going to be permanently implanted. So you'll be able to have all the information on that joint. That's one thing. Why? Because the longer we live, the more we're going to get shoulders and knees and hips and everything else. That's one thing. The other thing is uh, uh, I have an investment in a company called Relational Sciences. What is it? I'm coming down here today, and I want to meet um, the family that runs the Schnook family. They're my neighbors in Florida. That's why I know them. And I want to meet the head of the Schnook stores. This database has all my Rolodex contacts in it. I put the head of Schnook stores in over there. I hit send, and in a matter of seconds, it tells me all the different ways through my contacts I can get to that person. Now, I'll give you an exciting number. And I'm, this is a private company, so you can't buy the stock. But every single person that has seen it has bought it. You tell me, you people that deal with wealth management and high net worth, you tell me how precious it's going to be for you to know the name of somebody you want to get to, but you don't know him, and you know the guy's got a lot of money, and you want to pitch him. I'll give you a for instance, me personally. <clears throat> One of my managers was buying a company called Parker Hannafin. <clears throat> and I, I, I looked up in the, over the, uh, in the, uh, on the internet, and I saw the guy's name was Don Washkowitz, CEO. This is a Cleveland company, wonderful company. And I didn't know him. And I wanted him to come to New York, and I wanted to host a lunch for him and have him meet some of our investors. So. I went in on this system, and I found out Bonnie Hill, who's now the lead director at Home Depot, she succeeded me at Home Depot. Bonnie Hill is on the board of AK Steel, and the chairman of AK Steel is on the board of Parker Hannafin. I called Bonnie. Bonnie called the guy from AK Steel. He called me. What do you want to do with him? I told him. 20 minutes later, I got a call from Don Washkowitz. When can we get together? Pretty cool, right? So there's another one. We have a drug eluding stent. This is a tough market because it's a mature market. But we think the chemistry of the polymer on the stent makes the, the, the dissolution of the drug. You, what, ideally, you want, when you get a drug eluding stent, what it does is kills the tissue around where the stent is so you don't get restenosis, so you don't get reclosure. The ideal thing is get the drug in, get it to do its job, and get it out of the system. <coughs> this polymer is bioabsorbable, and it does the trick. Well, there's another one. Uh, public company, Mako Surgical. They do robotic surgery for hips and knees. Again, the amount of work that's being done in the healthcare field with robots is unbelievable. There's a company out in California called Intuitive, uh, Intu Intuitive Surgical. And they have got a robotic system for, for uh, 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 gastrointestinal surgery, uh, gynecological surgery. I mean, this is coming. So, I mean, there's, there's a few areas. You know, now, we look. <clears throat> we probably get pitched on uh, certainly five or ten deals within every two weeks. So we see a lot of stuff. But it always starts and ends with the people. If I, if I don't feel like I can be comfortable with that person, maybe the best thing since sliced bread, but it's not for me. I have time for what, what time is it? So I got I got time for what? I have time. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Sir, so uh, you know that we might have to learn a lot more from our mistakes than from our successes. What's mm -hmm. what's a mistake that you've gone through, and what's a lesson that you've taken away from it that you can share with us? That goes right back to what I just said. <clears throat> My judgment told me to stay away from the guy. But my greed said, do it. <coughs> and I got out of it with my skin, which was good.
But the aggravation I went through for not trusting my judgment about the quality of people was, always gets down to that. Look, if you're in business with good, decent people and they give it their best shot, the guy that runs the drug stamp company, his name's Art Benvenuto, I knew him when I sold my company to I IVAC to Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly sent him out to San Diego to run IVAC. That's how I got to know him 36 years ago. <coughs> and Art's given this thing everything he's got. If it doesn't work, it just wasn't meant to be, you know, you know, whatever reason, the technology, whatever. So the answer to me always is the quality of the people. That's tough to judge. Now, I, I will tell you this. Uh, the more times you get burned, the more you, ex you, you learn, <laughs> learn what not to do. And I've been burned more than, look, if you got, uh, people talk about, because you hear about Home Depot and you hear about Lily and all these others. If you got about six months, I can tell you all my failures, okay? I mean, <laughs> you, know, you, you don't go up to home plate and hit home runs every time. You know, there's a few strikeouts in between. So it's people again. Over here, yes, ma'am. Mr. Langone. Yes. Um, you were recently in a discussion with Kevin Warsh and he mentioned that uh, this, our economy, has not seen the extraordinary growth. Which Usually, one? Uh, it was on Squawk Box. Yes, Kevin Park. Walsh and Stan Ruckenmiller, we were on there together, yes. yes. And uh, he mentioned that our economy hasn't seen the extraordinary growth uh, usually associated after a recession. Uh -huh. So what monetary policies do you see hindering our country's growth? Well, I don't think, I think, I think we're being as uh, accommodative as we can be. I mean, I mean, zero interest rates, you can't be more accommodating than that. I can tell you right now what's strangling us is regulation. I'll give you a for instance. Our family office has 14 people. We do our payroll through automatic data processing. ADP offers a service to companies our size where we can go in through their system and get health insurance or any other kind of benefits we want for our people, and we get the benefit of bulk. In other words, if I go in for 14 people, the insurance company will say, this is what it is, take it or leave it. If I go in as part of 100,000 or 200,000 people, we got their attention. One day I'm in my office, and by the way, I think our governor in New York State, a Democrat, is doing a superb job. I think uh, as long as he does what he's doing with education, that, I'm a one-trick pony in that regard. I care about one thing. We gotta get these kids educated. We gotta get these kids to be able to participate in our society and in our economy. But anyway, so I get a call from ADP that there's a provision in the governor's budget which says that ADP is no longer allowed to sell us insurance or let us participate in that program. What are you talking about? He says it's in his budget. So I call up the governor and I said, look, if you want to be friendly to small businesses, this is not the way to be friendly. I don't know anything about it. I said, hmm. I said, he said, well, I'm sure it's not so. I said, well, why don't you check it out? So he calls me back. He says, you're right, it is so. We're going to get it out. And about a week later, I was curious, how the hell did it get in there? And they said, uh, HSS in Washington encouraged that provision. Now why, why would HSS, all I can conclude was, and this is my paranoia, so take it from, you know, we old people, we do strange things in our head sometimes. <laughs> Ask my wife, she'll tell you, she's younger than me, not by much, but she's younger. The only thing I can conclude was, they wanted to let the insurance companies make more money off the smaller guys as they beat up on the insurance companies to take care of a lot of what's coming next year. Now I have a right to an opinion I think this health care bill is going to be a monumental disaster in this country. And that's my opinion. I fought like hell to do what I could to make sure it didn't get passed. I lost. It's the law. It's the way it is. Experience will decide whether I was right or wrong. But overregulation in America is strangling us right now. Why? I can tell you right now, little companies, guys like mine, look, if, if I only hire one person, so I go from 14 to 15, that's a 7% expansion in my headcount. If everybody hired 7% more, it's staggering what would happen. But at a point in time where I'm looking at regulation after regulation, after, you look at, you look at Dodd-Frank. Now, in the spirit of candor, this is where I couldn't be a good politician because they wouldn't do this. 
I am a in significant investor in J.P. Morgan, the bank, because I think Jamie Dimon is the best operator in business in America, across all businesses. I'm a big fan of Jamie's. I knew him very well. He was on the board of Young Brands with me for a number of years. But anyway, I look, here's the banking industry. Now last year, you, you all read about the whale, you know, and this big mess, and Jamie being cavalier, and blah, blah, blah. In spite of the fact that they lost $6 billion of our money, my money. They didn't lose the government's money. They lost the stockholders' money. In spite of that, J.P. Morgan had record profits last year. I'm not going to say no big deal, but in the context of everything else, you look at the totality of the experience, the totality of the results. You look at Dodd-Frank, they still haven't figured out what the hell's in the law. And the price we're going to pay is staggering. You want to know where unemployment is at a record low? Go to Washington and all the suburbs around Washington, D.C. They're hiring like crazy. And they're using your money and my money and borrowed money to pay. Uh, obviously, you get some idea about my philosophy on life, and I'm sure, I'm sure there are people in here. Maybe I ought to have a Kevlar vest on right now. Yes, sir. Question? Yes. Okay. Make it tough, please. I come from Asia, and uh, I saw a lot of jobs being exported from America there, while a lot of people are losing their livelihood here. And when a job is exported from here, uh, the family loses insurance, and there's a lot of devastation. I have seen that. And then people in that part of the world, uh, they laugh at here and say, you know what, this is the only country that exports the jobs and gets rewarded for it. I'd like to hear your comments. You're talking about jobs being exported? Let me be an early prognosticator. Jobs are coming back. Jobs are coming back big time. I have a textile company in North Carolina. We have a facility in, uh, in um, El Salvador. Energy costs in El Salvador are five times what they are in America. All the energy is imported. The technology of our facilities is such that because we're using less labor and we use a lot of energy, it's flipping the other way. <laughs> Jobs are coming back. You, you, and, and again, look, let me say this to you. My father was in a union all of his life. I had the benefit of a wonderful education because I was able to get a union job building the Long Island Expressway in 1953, 54, and 55 when they were building the interstate highway system. I only had those because of, I am not anti-union. I am pro-union. And if you ask Gary LaBarbera, the head of the Building and Construction Trades Council in New York, about me, I will tell you, I have no opposition to unions. Every Home Depot store that was ever built Wherever it was, was built with union labor. Okay? Go to Detroit. I don't blame the unions. I blame the guys like me that were on the other side of the trade. Where was their courage to say, we can't pay it? No. They got told, in some cases, they were ordered by Washington, you better settle. Remember Roger Blau in 1961? Head of U.S. Steel? Got called to Washington by Kennedy and says, no strike, give them what they want. Look what happened to Detroit. Detroit, is, Detroit today is one-third of what it was in population 40 years ago. Water will find its own level, always. Labor is, in my opinion, labor is coming back. But the more we, 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 we are restricted, I'm not suggesting for a minute we should be allowed to belch as much smoke as we want or put as much dirty water as we want. None of that. I'm all for that. We can handle that. But, but when you get arbitrary and capricious rules that serve no purpose, that work. And why aren't people hiring? Well, one of the big reasons is they aren't sure what's going to happen to them with a health care bill. Let me give you a for instance. Home Depot has 340,000 associates, 180,000 of them, no more than that, 200,000 of them are full-time. 
We provide health insurance for all of that. Costs us about $9,000 a year per head. We won't do it. I hope we won't do it. Last I heard, we're not going to do it. I'm off the board now, and I'm, I'm a senior citizen, you know, out there wandering around Park Avenue, you know, <laughs> having a fudge sickle every once in a while, you know. Uh, we could save, we could say to the government, here, they're all yours, $2,000. Multiply 7,000 times 200,000, and that's how much we come to our bottom line. Now, we won't do it for one reason. We think that's part of our bond and our sacred contract with our associates, because we know that they won't get the coverage that way that they got with us. I'll give you another one. We have about 140,000 part-time people, like in the spring of the year when people are doing gardens and painting and stuff. We, we have a surge, and a lot of the people that work for us do it because, first of all, they wanted you. I'll tell you a great story, a little bit of humor. We had a fellow in, in the Boca Raton store that was carried out three times. He was about 80 years old, and he was a Jewish fella. And Bernie, uh, the store manager called Bernie. He said, Bernie, I keep firing the guy, and he keeps coming back. He said, you know. So Bernie said, well, I get Bernie has a home in Boca. So Bernie goes over, and he sees this guy. His name is Abe. He said, Abe, look, you're Jewish. I'm Jewish. You know about Jewish guilt. He said, Abe. Think of this. Think of what's go how I'm going to feel if they carry you out of here and you're dead. Think of the guilt I'm going to have. So Abe says, Bernie, I'll let you decide. If I stay home with Sadie, she drives me nuts. If I come here, I die. Bernie said you can stay, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story, by the way. But, but uh, we have a sacred bond with our people. These, these part-time people, many of them work because they don't have health insurance, and we have a plan where they can buy in, it's called, uh, it's called Minimed. They can buy into our health, and many of them take the money they get paid by us to buy the insurance. Now listen to this. If any of them work more than 30 hours, that voids every other person in that category, they all go automatically into the full thing. We have to pay a penalty. You know what's going to happen? I can't tell you the number of times in our company when a guy comes up and he says, Bernie, I just got a, a big auto insurance bill, or the store manager, can I work three or four more hours this week? Can I work five? Can I work an extra day? And it's the spring of the year and we're busy, and you say, sure, come in Saturday or Sunday. That's good, too, because we can give the full-time people a day off on the weekend. We can't do that anymore. It's against the law, because if we go over the 30 hours, boom. I can go on and, look, look, look. There are things that need to be regulated badly. But we are going nuts in America with regulation, and I think that will have more of a profound effect on unemployment or employment in this country than anything else. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay? All done? One more? Uno mas? None? Over there, right there, the fellow with a nice necktie on. My faith is everything to me. Now, I don't want to get spiritual, but I'm a daily communicant. Uh, I think there's more in how I got my parents who gave, if a parent's going to give a kid one thing, give them unconditional love. And then I met this beautiful woman that I married. Uh, my faith is as much a part of my being as anything else. And, and, I, and it's consistent with my belief that I'm not self-made. So all these people that God sent my way, I don't want to get, I don't, I don't want to get people talking about this as some sort of a spiritual meeting, but you asked the question. But my spirituality has manifested itself to me, to my benefit in more ways than I can count. The wonderful people I've met, uh, the, the, the judgment I've had to stay away from certain things that I might not have a lot of done. So, and I'm not saying because it's about making money and not making money, but I think this is one of the reasons that my wife and I are so profoundly committed to philanthropy. Because there has to be a better reason for what I've been able to do than just to accumulate all this wealth. So it's all about giving back. And by the way, you don't have to be rich to give back. I'm, I'm on the board of Ronald McDonald House, the biggest Ronald McDonald House in the world, 82 rooms. 
I don't get down very often, but when I get down, I go up to Ronald McDonald House and I see these little kids fighting like hell to live. And then I realize how petty my issues are. But, but you can give back in a variety. You can go up and read a kid a bedtime story. 25% of the kids in my charter school are homeless. So we, we can do things for them. We can take them to a ball game, or we can just sit and talk to them. This, you don't have to be wealthy to demonstrate a sense of purpose for somebody else. And I urge you to do that. By the way, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I have gotten so much more than I've given. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim. We'd, uh, we really appreciate Mr. Langone coming out today, he flew in his own airplane out here and at his own expense and coming back. And uh, at our age, Ken, I'm 63, you're 77, typically. You're I, a kid. Yeah, I am. I am a kid. We have a gift for you. Typically, when you close a deal, they have what they call a tombstone. Right. Well, at our age, we're going to call this engraved crystal. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. May <laughs> I open it? Yeah, you can open it. Can I open it, please? Now, by the way, I'm the kid with the pile of horse manure in the room. Don't forget that. This is a union-made crystal engraved. Well, that's fine. <laughs> well, my dad would have had a job then. He would have loved it. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Oh, look at this. Well, thank you so much. You're thank great. you very, very thank much. You so much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. You did a great job. Well, thank you. I hope. And then also on behalf of the True Last College of Business, which is proud to host the Smith Institute of Real Estate, on behalf of all of our partners and especially the students who, as I couldn't agree more, are the future. You know, we're the Tigers here at the University of Missouri, so we have a little token of our appreciation for you. Well, may I look at that too? You're a bison. Right? Oh, look at this. Wow. You're a union guy to pick it up. Look at that. Oh, mama. I'm a tiger. Is that a tiger? a tiger? I'm a tiger now. And a bison. And a bison. Thank you all very much. And remember, kids, get it done.